I've lost the title. Okay, the new title is, okay, Nick is going to talk to us about a matter which he will announce to us. Please welcome Nick Bostrom. <laughs> Um, yeah, it changed a little because I was asked also to try to say something uh, more general about uh, this set of issues before delving into some of the issues I'm thinking about right now. So um, I put in this first slide some near issues. These are things that people like to talk about when uh, the topic of ethics of AI comes up. So self-driving cars, people love to debate that. Um, you have a choice between running over three old ladies or, or two young um, uh, kindergarten kids. So what, what should you do? You know, how, many, how many old ladies before you should uh, run over the, the kindergarten kids? So I think, I mean, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting, uh, but maybe not the most important. So, I mean, I think there's 1.2 million people dying on the roads every day. Um, and it seems to me that from a practical point of view, the, the main issue there is just how can we roll out this technology sooner? How can we make progress on the engineering so that, that we can bring down uh, that death toll? Algorithmic discrimination. So this is when more and more um, automated processes are used to make decisions, whether to allocate credit, whether to maybe give parole or to do a lot of other choices, then it would be nice to be able to interrogate these and to see uh, what are the basis upon which these judgments are made. Uh, it might be that we don't always think accuracy is the only criterion. Uh, we might think that there are certain kinds of um, that information that shouldn't filter in to how somebody's treated. So there's discussion about that data ownership with privacy. Uh, <clears throat> Will firms use the information you give them to price discriminate against you? What, what are sort of our tolerance thresholds for that? Virtual vice, if virtual realities become uh, more and more lifelike, then are there certain behavior, even if they don't harm anybody, uh, that would nevertheless be intolerable, like really uh, vivid, realistic uh, games simulating rape, for example. You might think that's wrong, even if there is no, no actual victim there. Um, killer robots um, uh, is, is a big, Big topic, obviously, jobs, um, and then more sort of meta problems. So some people have complained about uh, how unrepresentative the, the field of, of AI is, and among the people thinking about it, uh, it's, it's kind of very uh, male dominated, uh, and it's a certain demographic. So does that shape the development of the field if, if there are only certain uh, types of people who are sort of participating in building these technologies? So, so these are all, as I, I mean, uh, as, as David said, these are all legitimate issues, and, and I look forward to. Uh, hiring a lot of conversation about uh, these over the uh, today and, and, and maybe tomorrow. But there's like an additional set, which is, well, so I should say that these are all, I think, can be kind of brought under the rubric. They are basically questions about how to live well and how our society should be organized now, given the current technological landscape. So how, how can we arrange, we have given this technology, how can we arrange this so that we have some decent outcomes? But there is uh, an, an additional set of issues, which I guess, um, uh, I have tended to focus more on. Um, so if one has some time scale, which I actually think looks more like this. Um, 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 th there's the big part that, that comes kind of after this technology has reached maturity. And um, I, I want to say more about that. But that, even that's not exactly right to capture what I have in mind. You can kind of distinguish choices that we make that have only relatively short-term uh, consequences. Um, and so you get to remake the choice a little bit later. So we can kind of increase the taxes this year, and then if we don't like it, we can decrease them next year. We can change things around. Um, so what I have in mind is not so much the kinds of ethical issues that arise far into the future. Rather, what I have in mind are ethical issues that might pertain to choices, if there are any such choices that we might make, that could have long-term consequences for where we end up, where earth originating intelligent civilization end up. Uh, and it's really those questions that are at the core of, of the work that, that we are trying to do at the uh, Institute. Um, so, um, so, so one of these um, is this AI alignment 
problem uh, that I talked a lot about in the book. So in a certain class of scenarios, um, in, in, in the class of scenarios where you have, um, where you have a super intelligence becoming very, very powerful, um, and there has been a lot of discussion about this, if at some point you have that, able maybe to shape the future according to its preferences, uh, then how can we ensure that the preferences that this AI will have will be ones that are aligned with what we want it to do so that we get some good outcome. Basically how you could control um, very powerful uh, AIs. And what we really are after here is scalable control. So there are a lot of control methods that exist now and that for the most part work perfectly fine. Um, you have the off switch, you have like some other simple mechanism and they are, they are completely adequate. Um, and you can propose more, but what really would be nice would be to have some set of control methods that are scalable in the sense that they would continue to work even as the system that you're trying to control becomes more intelligent. Ideally, they should work better the smarter the system becomes. And so some of the current things that we rely on might not be scalable in this sense. The off switch, for example, if you had a sufficiently uh, intelligent AI, a sufficiently powerful AI, it might prevent you from switching it off, or it might anticipate your action. And, uh, a reward button might be another kind of control method that works fine as long as you have control over the reward button and you can understand what the system is doing, but it might not be scalable. Um, so, um, so one approach to this uh, is the idea of giving the AI goals um, that coincide with others, with ours, so that um, the smarter the AI gets, the, the better it is able then to achieve our goals. And that's in principle a scalable control method, but it then faces this uh, challenge of how, how you can specify uh, what we really want um, accurately um, and, and, and in such a way that it doesn't have unforeseen consequences when, when really carried out to it, its logical uh, limit. I argued in the book for, I call it the orthogonality thesis, which is that there is no necessary connection between intelligence and values, that in principle you could have almost any combination. You could have you know, a really, really uh, smart system that is really nice or really nasty or have some arbitrary goal, or just as you could have a really stupid system that is nice or nasty. And we see this even within the human population. To some extent, you have all combinations, smart and dumb people are nice and evil or whatever, but this is a much larger space. Um, and um, one thing I would add is so a lot of this is a technical uh, engineering challenge rather than an ethics challenge. Um, I, there is still the question of what, what kind of goal ultimately we should uh, uh, like try to put in there. And I, I'd say that it's not at all clear that we would want that to be the goal of somehow optimizing uh, the morality of its behavior, like do the thing that is the best action to do or the, most, the action you're most confident is the right action. Um, because we don't really know what, what the true morality is. Like suppose it uh, turns out that it's some kind of um, just dessert theory, and turns out that what we all, maybe we're all a little bit rotten, so maybe we all just deserve um, a damn good spanking. And it's like, you have the future optimized according to this, maybe maximally morally correct, or, or some um, ice bucket uh, challenge or something like that, that just goes on forever. I mean, who knows really what the sort of truth about all these moral, so if you think of morality as maybe some way to organize ethical intuitions in some reflective equilibrium with other things, like who knows what would come out of that. And if you really put in as this unalterable goal in a very powerful optimization process, it might not be anything that we really would want at all. Um, so maybe morality is some kind of ingredient there, but it might not be so clear that we really on reflection uh, would want uh, this to, to do the morally optimal thing. Um, so, so there is this, but then there is this um, parallel challenge. So assuming you could solve the technical challenge of how to put human intentions, human goals reliably into an arbitrarily powerful intelligence. Um, there is still then this uh, political question that we confront, like uh, which goals to put in, who should decide? Um, what is the overall set of governance uh, structures that should guide our approach into this more uh, AI enabled future? And so this um, is an area where um, work is at an even earlier stage. So the control problem, I mean, a few years ago, there was almost nothing. There were like a couple of groups in the world who were thinking at all about that. And, and that has changed uh, over the last couple of years. And it's really 
amazing to see uh, new, new centers springing up and, and research papers are starting to get published on that. But this is at an earlier stage. This is maybe where work on the technical control problem was a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> so um, so there, there isn't anything very uh, complete or thought through to, to, to present here, but I want to just talk a little bit about some sort of work in progress that I'm doing um, uh, together with uh, Carrick Flynn and Daniel Dafoe. I think Daniel is in the audience here somewhere. Um, well, they haven't had a chance to uh, necessarily sync up on exactly all of these things I show on the slides, but these are some thoughts about how one might begin to think about this. So um, um, what I would like to uh, do as a first step is to think about what are the, so suppose somebody proposed some, some vision for how this should be governed. Um, some roadmap, some, like what are the, uh, the properties that one would like such a proposal to have in order for us to think that's a good proposal, that's something we could get behind. And um, um, in particular, we can look at these sort of normativity disorder, like what are these different rubrics, we'll look at some examples within each one of these, um, of, of types of features that it would be nice if, if our sort of proposal for how humanity should move forward to this would have. Um, and, um, um, I suggest that a, a useful focus here is maybe not so much what's sort of the end state, but more we could try to evaluate a, a paths forward that start from where we are now and then lead somewhere into the future because one might have preferences or intuitions not just about the destination, but also about the, the, how, how, how the decisions as to how to move forward should go on, the overall shape of this. Um, we need to combine it at some point. Um, uh, sooner rather than later with considerations about feasibility. Uh, so we want some proposal that actually could work, not just something that would be nice in, a, in, 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 in an ideal world. And, and it's important there to consider a second best option. So you might have a view about what should be the best, but you might also want to have views, you might almost want to have a vector field, as it were, with kind of views about what should happen in any different situation where you might end up. Or if you're advising somebody and there is like the best thing that they should do, but for whatever reason they are just unwilling to do that, you might still want to have a view about where on the margin, what, what might they, where, where should they go if you could just kind of push them to do a little bit more of one thing or another. Um, and we also want to consider a commitment mechanisms whereby um, early choices might uh, lock in later choices. So let's just briefly go through some, some thoughts on this. Um, so on the efficiency, um, we want to look at what, what is different in this context of machine superintelligence. So there are obviously all kinds of considerations that apply here just as they apply to all the other things we do, but um, there are perhaps certain distinct, distinctive issues or ones that have more weight in this context. So AI safety work seems like an important thing here and getting an efficient outcome, meaning one that is kind of just increases the size of the pie available. Um, particularly um, by um, reducing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the risk externalities uh, that could come from this. So um, if, if this transition to the machine intelligence era happens, um, all, all humans, uh, wherever you are on Earth, even if you're sitting in a little hut in, in Indonesia and have had no vote or in, input on this, you, you still, if there are gonna be risks, you're still gonna also face those risks. So it seems, um, that one thing one can do is to <clears throat> recognize an ob ob obligation there to, to put an extra effort on that. Uh, timely uh, development <clears throat> and rollout in terms of the enormous benefits that can come from this. There is a kind of arguably a, a, an, an urgency there, uh, in particular insofar as we care about people uh, who exist now, as opposed to impartially about bringing new people into existence to replace us. But if the, if the goal is to benefit the seven billion people right now, the clock is running out, like we are uh, dying uh, and, and suffering all kinds of ills. Um, and um, avoiding global uh, coordination failure. So there's a distinct, and I don't really have time to go into them, but there are certain, there's a certain class of ways in which things could go wrong. And I think it's a large chunk of, of all the different ways that things could go wrong that go wrong because there is a failure at the global level to coordinate. That's, that's why we can have uh, wars and arms races and destruction of the global commons and Malthusian outcomes and so forth. Um, um, considering this um, vulnerable world hypothesis, for, for want of a better name, would, you could consider this hypothesis that there is some level of technological development at which offense strongly dominates defense in the sense that 
at that level of technology, it would be feasible uh, for a small group to take some action that would lead to the destruction of the world independently of what other people do after that action has been taken. So we don't know whether the uh, vulnerable world hypothesis is true, but maybe it is, and then you can think about if it is true, what are the kind of arrangements that would have been put in place so that we can uh, um, uh, maintain the, the world uh, uh, intact even when it enters such a vulnerable phase. And so this ability to undertake some kind of um, stabilization of the world, if that should be necessary, some way to, um, if, if there is some really dangerous technology that just would be much more easier to use to cause destruction, then maybe there would have to be some way to prevent either the proliferation of that or to very closely monitor its use. And, and that seems like another important variable to consider when looking at different paths for us. Do they allow for conditional stabilization? Do, are they such that if it turns out that the world is vulnerable in this sense, that the world could then be stabilized, the control could be centralized, if that should be necessary? Or is the, is, is the development just such that there is no way for anybody or any group of people to kind of rein, rein it in or, or steer it? Um, <clears throat> allocation, so again, um, yeah, we all have this risk externality. Um, also, the, uh, there is this kind of bonanza that would have, if this goes well, the, the amount of, of wealth and prosperity unlocked is, is enormous. It's this giant windfall. You kind of open up not just technological maturity here on Earth, uh, but also all the space resources that our descendants can start to colonize. Um, economic growth for a period of time um, may become extremely rapid. Robin Hansen has, has a recent book where he uh, you know, discusses uh, the world economy doubling every month or so for a period of a couple of years. And so you could have this explosive growth uh, in, in productivity, um, which also I think changes the allocational question somewhat. So it's, it's more, if, if you have such a large abundance, it becomes more plausible, I think, that if, if, you, could, if you could give everybody a really uh, superb life in great prosperity, even by just carving out sort of 1% or a tenth of a percent of the overall resource pie, then it seems to become much more of a no-brainer that you should at least do that. Whereas right now, there are more kind of trade-offs. Like some people would have to give up significant wealth in order for everybody to have a good life, or you might worry about economic incentives if you tax people too much. But this would be a unique situation where you might argue that there should be, perhaps be some kind of basic allotment. Um, and another interesting uh, feature here is that we are currently, uh, to a large extent, behind the veil of ignorance. Nobody knows when AI, when superintelligence will be developed, who will develop it, for what purposes. Um, so we kind of all have a shared interest, if we could, in reaching an agreement now um, to some kind of equitable, reasonably equitable distribution of influence and wealth of the benefits. It's like an insurance scheme. You would rather have. Um, you know, a certainty of, of getting, you know, a, a seventh billion slide of this than, than, than having, you know, one in a seven billion chance of getting all of it because there are diminishing returns um, to wealth and, and power. Um, so you might um, so think that that could argue for some kind of uh, continuity, that, that if, if, we, if there are pathways that don't completely reshuffle the deck and just make some random set of people the winners and some other people are the losers, but instead something that was more continuous with the existing status quo distribution that, that could be a desirable uh, feature. Then, then we have this um, set of issues that are concern the uh, creation of new people or new morally relevant entities um, with uh, uh, the possibility of, of, of mind crime, as I, I call them. So these, if you have, so right now we think of our computers as just objects, you could take a hammer and smash them, it doesn't really matter. The only question right now is how do the computers affect us? Um, right now it doesn't matter how we affect the computers because they, they don't matter. But you could argue um, that at some point they might well start to matter. I, I've, I've um, proposed a couple of principles that uh, um, include this principle of substrate non-discrimination so that if you had something that was um, functionally uh, and mentally equivalent, it wouldn't, from a moral point of view, fundamentally matter um, what its substrate of implementation was, whether it was 
silicon in a digital computer or, or carbon in a, in a human brain if they had the same functional properties and the same mental states, that that, that would be no more relevant than whether your skin is white or black. Um, another would be uh, a principle of ontogeny, non-discrimination, so that holding fixed what you are, it shouldn't matter um, how you were created. Um, at least, I think these are principles to consider. It might well be that we need to qualify them, but, but uh, as a starting point, another would be a principle of subjective time. So if there are cases where it, um, it matters morally how long something continues for, say, if somebody is suffering, it's worth if they suffer for 10 minutes than if they suffer for five minutes, and if you could prevent either five minutes of one person suffering or 10 minutes of somebody else's suffering, you should, other things equal, prefer to prevent the 10 minute suffering. In those cases, um, when you have digital minds, uh, there are two different senses of time that can come apart because if you run the same mind on a faster computer, its subjective rate of time will go faster, even though clock time will remain the same. So the question then arises, which of these two <clears throat> senses of time are morally relevant? And I um, suggest that it's the subjective sense of time. So if you run a, 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 an upload mind twice as fast, then it kind of accumulates moral weight twice as fast as well. Um, and, and they, they, but these are, even if these were correct, they would only scratch the surface. There is like <clears throat> all kinds of exotic minds with weird preferences and strange properties that nobody has yet thought about even what we, what, what we, what we think would be their, their moral status. So um, in, in addition to trying to um, prevent mind crime, we're seeing it as a desideratum of a path forward that it reduces the amount of mind. And, and by the way, so this doesn't only arise once you have sort of human level things living in machines. It, it could arise a lot sooner. We think that a lot of animals have moral status. And maybe once you have AIs, say with a similar capabilities as, as, a, as a mouse or something like that, um, you, you should start to think about whether we should accord it similar moral status as we do it. If you wanna do medical experiments on a mouse, you have to go through an ethics committee and you have to like anesthetize the mouse and it's not so much whether you kill the mouse at the end, but it's like that it doesn't suffer needless. Anyway, so that's, that, that can arise uh, a lot sooner. And it seems like a silly thing right now, but I think it will go from silly to controversial um, in, at some point in maybe the next 15 years or so. Um, then, then we also have this ease with which you can um, produce more offspring or copies. So with humans, it's a slope. But, but here you could, in principle, instantaneously copy yourself assuming available hardware. So you, you then have an immediate conflict between two moral intuitions we have, this sort of reproductive freedom. Everybody should decide for themselves how many kids they want to have, and the idea that maybe there should be some minimum welfare standard, at least for kids. Um, but, but if you combine these two, then um, it just doesn't work, right? Because you have even one person just likes to make more and more copies. They can sort of very quickly eat up the entire resource pool, and you have an immediate descent into Malthusian condition. Voting, similarly, if you could sort of just give yourself more votes by duplicating yourself, um, kind of distorts the system. So maybe you would need to move to some voting based on on, on your wealth, or they have each person has a suffrage token that can get split amongst their descendants, or something like that. Um, process. So, in addition to these kind of more outcome-based properties, we might also care about how these outcomes are decided and what happens along the trajectory. In particular, one might um, have intuitions favoring um, some sort of legitimacy the, um, th that you want. You, you want when whatever. I, maybe you think, I don't know exactly how the future should be, but I would want it to be determined by legitimate processes. And um, exactly what is legitimate here is, can be complicated. It might not be enough to say, say, have somebody consenting to it. I mean, suppose it were the case that a sufficiently advanced AI could persuade you into anything um, by sort of structuring a set of arguments and stimuli in an appropriate way, then consent might not be sufficient. And you, um, and, um, um, and finally, um, we might have a, a discussion about some of the meta. So if there are these different um, desiderata that might not all be completely satisfiable, and we have to trade off different degrees of satisfaction. So how should we do that? I propose um, this parliamentary model where, where you kind of think of 
so suppose you have different moral theories making different claims, you can think of each moral theory as, as a party uh, that gets to send delegates to this imaginary parliament of deliberation. And each theory gets to send a, a number of delegates proportional to the probability you give to that moral theory. And then you imagine this parliament kind of deliberating and, and whatever that parliament would then decide is what you should do. Uh, and the idea here is that they can trade among one another. So if some moral theory, maybe you think it's only 30% likely, but it really cares a lot about one particular choice. Maybe that theory gets its way on that choice, and maybe it kind of defers to other theories on other choices. Um, and you could expand this to include not just moral theories, but maybe you have self-interest or different constituencies who can kind of... So it's, it's a sort of... tries to be a robust way uh, to achieve compromise solutions that allow for, for wins. Um, and um, finally also, in addition, uh, it might become important what the um, decision theory and the epistemology is that, um, that is, determines the long-term future. And then one might make some proposal there that that should be based on the actual decision theory that, that humans have or that we would on reflection have or something like that. Um, so that's all that I have time for, folks. Um, I look forward to the next two days. Thank you. OK, so now we have some time for stay up here because we have time for a few questions. Just a little bit about how this works. We'll have um, three talks, most of which will be um, 20 minutes. Each of them will be followed by 10 minutes or so for a Q&A for the individual talks. After all three talks, we'll get all three speakers on stage, and there'll be a chance for a bit of interaction among the group and questions for, from the audience. But for now, we've got time for a few questions for Nick. We have people, John will um, run, the, run the mic, looking for hands for questions. There's one there. Ah, there we go. Hi, thank you, my name is Heather. Uh, my question is, you raised several issues about government, which is very interesting to me because I used to work for the United Nations and I'm a human rights lawyer. Um, I've noticed that as technology evolves, government also evolves. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether or not you think the evolution of government is anywhere near close to being able to deal with the kind of challenges that the technology is now posing. And people think of parallels with like the nuclear arms race and was our government development in line with what we were technologically capable of? The, the government is what it is. Um, <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it would be nice if it improves and I think there are a lot of exciting ideas for how you could do that. I mean, it strikes me though that, um, so there are these I know some people who are into, uh, say, um, these uh, cryptocurrencies and Ethereum, and they envisage sort of some decentralized system that nobody has. But that often the very first use case they think of is, oh, so maybe the United States could run like this. <coughs> it seems to me that, um, that there should be a, a very long uh, trajectory between a cool new idea and applying it to some kind of world important system that you would want to try it on small scales. First, and then if it still looks like a good idea half a century or two centuries later, then you know maybe you would really <clears throat> want to like apply it uh, to the things that matter most. Um, I, I mean, it, it's such a big question how how technology can. I mean, I, I think there are the low hanging fruits that. We, so what, what, one one thing I've always thought would be uh, cool is to have a. a prediction market, a well-subsidized prediction market on, on policy futures. So you could see the running odds of the, um, the likely uh, consequences of adopting a certain policy. Like if you, if you raise the tax rate 5%, will economic growth be higher or lower uh, five years down the line? You know, if, if, you, if you close the border to Mexico, will there be more or fewer terrorist incidents. And so you could have speculators um, betting on these things and then kind of read out from that some, some kind of market probability estimate that could maybe discipline um, some of the speculations. Uh, but um, it, it is a hard thing to do. So, um, so there's this technical control problem and, and there is this 
governance problem. Now, arguably, 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 they are equally important in the sense that they shape the outcome equally, but it might be a lot more important to work on the technical problem because it's just harder to have a big impact on the, even if, you, even if you've thought out all the answers to this kind of set of governance issues, it's just much less obvious how that would impact what actually happens. And if you come up with a really clever technical solution to the control problem, there's a good chance that it will be implemented. So in that sense, that might be less important. Okay, uh, yes, thank you. I wanted to draw you out on something that's a classical angle to this whole thing, which is that it seemed to me that the interest of a lot of the questions that you're asking is premised on the systems in question being conscious. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to ask you is whether you thought that was true or whether you thought no, as long as they're complex enough, it doesn't really matter whether they're conscious in, in the familiar sense. Um, of course, the question how you tell, I don't just mean the question of what consciousness is, but the question how you tell whether a certain organism or a unit is conscious is much debated, but one with no clear solution. Um, and so I was surprised that it played virtually no role in the way you were laying out the landscape of the issues. I think the only uh, set of issues that depends on whether the machines are conscious is mind crime, um, where it matters for whether we think it, it, it makes a difference morally, whether yeah. the thing in the box is conscious or not. But for the other uh, purposes, in terms of thinking about how machines affect the human condition, I think one can abstract away from, from that. that. What's relevant are their functional attributes. Um, and I think it's an open question uh, how easy it is, say, to build something that is not conscious but still performs at a very high level of intelligence. Uh, we, we just don't know whether sort of the easiest way to achieve versatile general intelligence involves something that we would on reflection think probably is conscious or whether the easiest way to do that is through some very different architecture that we wouldn't think is conscious. I, I'm very uncertain about that. Hi. So my question is actually a little bit similar to what his question was. I was interested in your principles of substrate non-discrimination and ontogeny non-discrimination. Um, I came to this conference thinking the ethical implications of artificial intelligence more relied upon the implementation of these systems in society. I didn't consider actually having to respect these systems as possibly being conscious or some form of human intelligence. Um, so my question first was, how do you determine if something is to be, is a mind to be respected? And also, what, is, should there be any difference at all between, say, a human mind and a simulation of a human mind in, say, an experiment? So you're right on the first, that for the most part, uh, the issue is about certainly the present issues is about how we humans use these machines and how they affect us. Um, I was introducing this as an, a hair, it's actually a, an issue that has been very little discussed, but that I could, could be important. Um, if nothing else, be, because of just the sheer numbers, that it is very easy in certain kinds of machine learning, um, training and um, experiments to, to create huge numbers of these uh, system. So if they had some moral status, then if, if you have any kind of aggregative intuitions where, where how much something matters depends on how, how many people are affected or how many minds are engaged in it, that it could come to, it could possibly come to dominate the, the sum total of, of say, human uh, minds that have existed through history at some point. Um, but this is a, a kind of an, a niche issue at the moment. And I, I, I gave it some time precisely because it has been neglected. Uh, so I wasn't trying to allocate my speaking time proportionally to how much people have actually been talking about these different things. Um, of the things you've mentioned, what is humanity most likely to fail at? To fail at? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think the mind crime thing is fairly likely to fail at that because if you look at uh, the difficulties we have uh, in extending empathy to animals, um, we still have a long way to go there, I think. And animals have faces and they can squeak. 
Um, but if, if these were invisible processes happening in a microprocessor, it would be so much harder uh, to, to see that, that, that we might want to take that into account. Um, um, so, uh, to, to give a more detailed answer is hard because you would have to sort of distinguish degrees of failing at something. Uh, and uh, the real question is maybe not what are we most likely to fail at, but where on the margin could, say, the efforts by one extra person or one extra dollar most decrease the chance of failing uh, in a way that would make a profound difference to the future. Um, and it might be that uh, working on something that we're probably going to succeed at, but where maybe you could reduce the risk that we will fail at it by a small fraction might be better than working on the most likely failure point. But anyway, so that becomes a more complicated conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.